Um, as you could be this is used here from the little bit of membranes once or twice, so we just uh, really I would have had another five minutes just to go through the last uh, slides there, but um, I'll just I'll go through this topic here on this slide um, and then uh, we'll wrap up the session and go to the next one. Just a uh, one important note on these is in the class last time, slide 76, there's a there's an error, a uh, type mode was for the rejection coefficient R. Please uh, correct your notes as follows. If that's up on the board, there's the correct definition for R. That's uh, 1 minus the permeate concentration or the permeate concentration. I had uh, the retentate concentration in the denominator. So that uh, should be CF in the denominator and not CR. That's what slide 76. So it's essentially just a measure of the recovery that you've made of the, of the, of the salt in the uh, solute in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the system. The reject, sorry, not recovery, the ability to reject. So CP is, should ideally be close to zero, CF is then whatever you feed in. Uh, sometimes you'll see recovery which is CP of the CF itself. But then rejection is one minus that. So, so that's, that's just one correction. And then let's just uh, take a look here. Uh, what I wanted to cover last class was then just how do we relax that assumption that the retentate leaving is not equal to the feed concentration. So prior to that, we assumed that if we had a membrane system um, and we had a feed entering over here, then there's some flux of the solvent and of the salt through the membrane. So here's our feed entering with, with concentration CF and flow rate QF. And further down in, in the tubular system, for example, we would have our retentate leaving CR with a flow rate QR. Then on the permeate side of the membrane, we've got nothing coming in, but then leaving, we have concentration CP in the permeate, close to zero ideally, and then Q permeate, flow rate to the permeate. So prior to this uh, slide, we had assumed that the retentate concentration leaving is essentially the feed concentration. Clearly that's not a, a feasible assumption other than very crude calculations. Um, it essentially says our membrane doesn't do, do much other than just take the material and send it straight out again. And we do know that we have some of that material permeating through, through the membrane. Some of the salt or uh, solute, it's called solute, salt and most often, um, is, is in fact permeated through the membrane. So we need to relax this assumption that the, that the retentate concentration is not equal to the feed concentration. So the way we do that is we, we have to solve a set of equations. We get multiple equations with multiple unknowns and uh, they're, you end up with a nonlinear system. So this is one approach how to solve it. So let's uh, take, a, take a look up here. Uh, Let's summarize the equations that we're dealing with. The first one is we, we have this cut definition. So cut theta is the permeate flow rate QP divided by the feed flow rate. So ideally that's a number around 40%, 60%, uh, telling us what volume of our, our fraction of our feed is then leaving in the permeate. Now ideally we would like that cut to be quite high, but that's not, not always feasible. Um, sometimes we run, run these systems with very low cuts. But that, so that definition theta then defines what the cut is. Then we have our mass balance across the system. So QF times CF, our inlet salt. So those units that gives you kilograms of salt per unit time is equal to the salt leaving in the retentate of the permeate. We also have a third equation in the volume balance. So the feed entering, volumetric flow rate of the feed is equal to the retentate of the permeate. Uh, so that's those three, first three, uh, sorry, equations two and three are familiar to us already. Now we uh, simply express uh, one of the equations in terms of the other. If I take uh, equation, uh, let's take equation three there and divide it by QF on the left and the right hand side, I'll get equation four. So equation four, just divide equation three by QF and then we notice that that last term QP over QF is the definition of theta that we had prior. Equation 5 then is derived from equation 2 by taking equation 2 and 
dividing equation 2 to the R by QS, left and right hand side, we will obtain equation 5. And then we also sub in uh, parts of equation 4. So equation 5, uh, that one minus theta term, for example, that we see over there, so if we take equation 4, one minus theta from equation 4 is equal to QR divided by QN. And that's exactly what uh, would be uh, would find that it had taken uh, equation 2 and divided it by QN. So equation 5 is not too hard to get. But that should be comfortable for you. Now equation 6 is then the definition of the flux of salt leaving in the permeate. By that I mean if we take a solvent flow rate over here, solvents flow rate passing through the membrane for the entire unit area. So let's just take a look at the units I put up over here. The solvents flux is expressed as meters cubed of solvent per unit time per area. Multiplied by Cp. So Cp's units are mass of salt per unit volume of solvent. So that's essentially the concentration of the salt leaving in the permeate stream. If I take the flux of the solute, uh, sorry, the solvent, multiply by that concentration, that's the mass of salt that's passed through the membrane. And you can see that from the units as well. You get, after multiplying these, you, it simplifies to uh, kilograms of solute per meter cubed of solvent per unit time. Uh, sorry, kilograms of solute per meter squared per unit time. Then, so that's equation six, and what I've sub substituted in it is the definition for J solvent, which we've worked with earlier. And then equation seven, finally, is the flux of salt, which is the definition we had prior. So it's the mass transfer coefficient times the concentration difference between the retentate and minus the permeate. So that's, that's the standard definition for salt flux we remember. Now equation six and seven equal each other uh, because the salt flux leaving in the permeate must be for the salt flux that's passing through the membrane. Uh, that's the only way place where salt is transferred. So salt in is salt out, essentially is what equation six and seven is. Um, so if we, if we just write it one other way for you that sometimes helps to understand it a bit, a bit clearer. If I take um, Cp, that's the concentration of the salt leaving in the permeate. One other way to see that is to simply say, well, that's equal to the flux of salt through the membrane, J salt, divided by the flux of solvent passing through the membrane. So the, the amount of salt per unit time per unit area divided by the amount of solvent per unit time per unit area is essentially the concentration of the salt leaving the permeate. Because the permeate stream is only made up of salt that moves through the membrane, and the only source of the permeate uh, liquid uh, solvent is that solvent that's passed through the membrane. So, so that definition uh, will, will, will perhaps help you see what equation 6 is. Equation 6 is simply a rearrangement of this, saying J solvent times Cp is equal to J salt. So, so that's an alternative way to visualize how, or understand how equation 6 is equal to equation 7. So that's, that, those are our equations we deal with. Let's take a look at um, our unknowns. So we've got a number of unknowns, but in principle, we, if you think of a practical system, we almost always know our feed concentration that's specified to us, so we can easily measure it. We know what, we're, what our sources that we're trying to, uh, to purify. So we know CF. We, we know our volume that we need to treat, QF. So CF is known, QF is known, theta is specified. So theta is, a, is our operational characteristic. It's how much we open the, the valve spike to regulate the flow. So we can, we can use theta as a way to regulate the system. But obviously, if we change theta, those relative flows, we're going to expect different CPs and CRs. So every time I regulate whether I want more flow in my permeate or less flow in the permeate, I expect a change in my concentrations leaving that membrane because I'm essentially changing the residence times in that in that membrane system. So theta is, is our operational value that we set, so we, we also know that. And we also know our mass transfer coefficients, A salt and A salt. So those, uh, we had a class exercise on Friday to show how those can be determined from lab experiments. Delta P, we know as well from simple measurements across our membrane, what those pressure drop, what that pressure drop would be. 
Then here we are only unknowns in a practical situation are these here. So CP, we wouldn't know, QP, CR, and QR. So those would be our unknowns. Um, but once we've set theta, we actually do know what QP is. Okay, so QP can easily be calculated once we've decided on theta. And once we know QP and we know QF, we obviously know what QR is from the volume balance. Okay, so then now we're left with really essentially two unknowns. What is the retentate concentration and the permeate concentration? And prior to this, we had simply said, well, I'm just going to assume that the retentate concentration is the feed concentration. What I'm saying now is we can't make that assumption. So what we end up with is, is those equations up there. We find that we get these two unknowns and we, we simply solve as follows. Once we specify the CF and the theta, we guess the value of CP. What's a, what's a reasonable guess? If you don't choose reasonably and you're doing this in a test or an exam, you're going to be spending five or six iterations going through all these normal equations. So you really want a good CP to start off with. Yeah? 100 PPF. 100 PPF? Just, just <laughs> because? Okay. Right, so it's, it's, it's a reasonable value to start with, so a very small concentration, 0.1%, 100 ppm, something small to get going that's obviously non-zero. Uh, it's got to be above zero, clearly. It's got to, it, it can't be zero itself because uh, that's exactly what we, we recognize. We've got a non-zero permeate salt. Um, so anything that's small, anything that's just above zero would work well. Um, that's, that's quite, quite, quite an adequate guess. Uh, another way to look at it is to simply say the rejection coefficient, R, which is equal to 1 minus CP over CF. That rejection coefficient has values that's typically between 90 and 96%. So if you choose a value of, say, 95% for, for R, you can back calculate what CP is. We know CF already. So a reasonable guess for CP then can be found from that. For most, most of these RO systems, we find that, that rejection coefficient is in that order of uh, magnitude. So between 90 and 95%, sometimes a little higher. So that's a good initial guess for CP. <coughs> then, uh, then we're set to go and help and go through the iterations. So calculate CR from equation 5. Uh, so if we look up at, at equation 5, the only unknown there is CR. Now we've got the retentate concentration and the permeate concentration value. So we've guessed our CP, we've back calculated what CR is. Now we can go through those equations. One thing to recognize is that the retentate concentration is going to affect. Where's my pointer? Okay, so the retentate concentration, CR, is going to affect that term delta pi, the osmotic pressure difference. The osmotic pressure difference is delta P on the, on the bulk side of the membrane minus the, the, the osmotic pressure on the permeate side of the membrane. So let's, uh, let's quickly just recap that again. Important to remember that delta, delta pi is pi on, the, on this bulk side of the membrane. So previously we used pi of the feed, but that's not, ex not, not expressly true. Be correct? One there is pi of the retentate minus pi of the permeate. <coughs> so the retentate concentration then is used to calculate the osmotic pressure on the retentate side. So once we've guessed CR, or calculated CR I should say, we can then go and calculate pi R. And also, since we've guessed CP, the permeate concentration, we can go calculate pi P. So once we've guessed those two concentrations, we can then go calculate delta P, by uh, delta pi, I should say. Delta P is known, A salt is known, then we can go calculate J salt. Multiply that by our guess value of CP, and then we come down to equation seven. So now we've got our retentate concentration, our CP, um, A salt, and then we've just calculated J solvent times CP. J solvent times CP, we can set that equal J salt, and then back estimate what CP would have been. Okay, so it's a, we, 
we get CP where we come down to equation 7 and we compare the CP that we back calculate from, from equation 7 and compare it to our original CP that we, we started off with. And we're going to get a revised estimate of CP that way. So an updated value of CP then and then we repeat back from this step and repeat through until convergence. So it should be about two or three iterations. Okay, so uh, just a, a few confused faces, so let's quickly recap that. We guess CP, back from get CR. So we have our two main concentrations we're looking for in the outlets. So the permit concentration here and the CR concentration here. These are just guessed values. So they're not accurate, they're just initial guesses. But those two concentrations affect the osmotic pressure. So pi r and pi p get affected by those two guesses. So we get a revised estimate then of the osmotic pressure difference. We plug that into equation 6. We know everything else in equation 6. That term over there, A solvent times delta c times delta pi minus delta pi times cp, that is equal to J salt. What we have. So essentially that term over there is equal to J salt then we use equation 7 and that calculate what CP would have been. That gets an updated value of CP and then we repeat through that, that sequence that into conversions. Okay. Anything I'm clear? Matt, this is a, the question 4 or 5 in the, in the next, or in the, in the current assignment. So you have to follow this procedure there. Uh, I, would avoid you, I would recommend you don't do it by computer. The temptation is just to use goal C, obviously, or something along those lines, but this is something you should be able to do uh, by hand. Okay. So, yes? Okay, uh, the delta pi. Yes. Okay, so let's just quickly recap here. These terms. If I could write that out, I could write it as CR minus CP times the gas constant uh, R times T times A, the number of ions formed. Okay, so, so if this is NaCl, A would be 2. So it's not, you can't just simply plug in the concentration, you have to take it, this is the number of moles of NaCl per meter cube, but then you have to realize you have twice as many ions present in the system to calculate pi. Now one thing that, uh, if you're, if you're uh, a student here, you'll realize that delta, uh, that CP is always going to be a small value. So in my second iteration, I don't really need to update my estimate of pi P. It's a small number to begin with, and it's going to stay small. So once you've estimated it once, you probably don't need to revise it, so you can just do a little bit less work there. Yeah, but your retain tank concentration is going to change for you. And it will affect this estimate. Uh, yeah, you can simply calculate them individually. So CR, you, you don't have to simplify, I simplified it actually. So you can just calculate pi r and then pi p. The main thing that's driving this is pi r. Pi p is a very small back osmotic pressure. Um, if anything, if ignoring it, you're going to be better off because pi r works, uh, pi p works in your favor. Pi r is the one that's counteracting the pressure. So if by ignoring the, the permeate osmotic, osmotic pressure, you're actually, um, you're going to be better off. Okay, any questions uh, regarding membranes before we move on to the next section? Okay, so uh, feel free to, to email me if there's uh, something that's not quite clear or uh, you'll discover anything that's not clear in the assignment. So let's move on to liquid liquid extraction. This is the next section in the course. Um, we'll be looking at this for the next few classes. experiment shown up here. You've got your aqueous phase, or your organic phase, and your, and your aqueous phase, and you shake it up in the funnel, and then you separate, let it settle out, separate it, and then you measure concentrations in so usually the aqueous phase. Have you done that? So you closed your chemistry course? Yeah. yeah? Okay, so you're familiar with this, with this principle of uh, liquid-liquid extraction, where we're take, essentially trying to extract an interesting solute, so uh, let's, be, let's just quickly look here at what we, the constituents in the system. We've got three 
species at the minimum in a liquid liquid extraction. We've got the material that we're interested in recovering for the solute, and then we've got that solute dissolved in both phases. So here we've got a heavier liquid phase and then a lighter um, uh, organic phase. And that sol solute is present in both phases. So that we've got three species of interest at a minimum in liquid liquid extraction. We're, we can have multi-components, four or five components, but we're not dealing with that in this course, but we, we deal with, with uh, computer simulation. So we're dealing with three species here, and that solute is distributed between both both phases over there. And in the lab experiment, you would, you're trying to move that solute from one of the phases to the other phase. So the solute initially may be in the organic phase and you're trying to move it over to the aqueous phase, or it might be the other way around. Either way, you shake that system vigorously and you create, uh, or you, you cause mass transfer to take place. So if that system on its own, you would have the species move between the two phases and reach equilibrium after an extremely long time if you were just relying on molecular diffusion. So no extra energy added to the system, in other words, purely molecular diffusion, you will reach equilibrium but after an extremely long time for this batch, batch process. Essentially what you're doing here by hand is a batch process. So we shape this then for a, for a while allow mass transfer to take place through eddy diffusion. So we're essentially adding a mechanical energy to the system to encourage mass transfer to take place faster between the two phases. Then you let it settle and equilibrate. So that's the, that's the general principle. What we're going to look at is how this works on a continuous operating basis. So sure, we can, can do the batch mode, but generally we're interested in these systems operating in continuous mode. So we have our feed over here. And our feed is one of the liquids in the liquid-liquid extraction system. So in an LLE system, our feed actually contains one of the liquids that we're already considering, in addition to the solute, which we'll, we'll call A. So we've got the species A that we wish to recover from our feed, and our feed, or more correctly, we'll call something called feed solvent, um, is one of the liquids in the system. Other people also can also see the terminology carrier solvent. So you've got your carrier coming in with your feed. So that stream over there is actually two species, your feed and your carrier. Um, and then we're also adding then our mass separating agent here, which is the, the sol which when we refer to solvent, we're referring to the other liquid. So by de default, solvent is not necessarily the organic phase in the system. Solvent here refers to the other liquid you're adding, the mass separating agents. So it's by convention, it's the added liquid. So if, for example, my, my species that I'm interested in recovering, my solute, is already dissolved in an organic phase, we sometimes usually call that organic phase the solvent. We tend to, to refer to organic phases as our solvent. But in liquid liquid extraction, the terminology is very clear. The solute is dissolved in the feed solvent the feed or the carrier, and then the solvent is the additional liquid we add to the system, in other words, our mass separating agent. We contact those in an extractor and allow that mass transfer to take place uh, on a continuous basis. So there's, a, there's mixing in here that of some sort, or some, some form of mass transfer to allow that solute to move from our carrier phase over to this extracting solvent. And there's also a separation in here that allows those two liquids then to naturally separate. So these two liquids are chosen so they're immiscible. So that's, that's a, there's, a, there's a lot of criteria on selecting a proper solvent uh, that you use over here, but one of the main criteria obviously is that that solvent must be immiscible with the carrier. So that when we, after contacting, we want them to separate. And then we have two new terms that we will just introduce here. We have the raffinate and the extract. So the raffinate then is the residual solute appears in this way. So our solute concentration in the raffinate is usually much lower. And then our extract stream is the stream where the solute is mostly present. Okay, 
and then we'll use this definition of Ya for the extract and Xa is the concentration of the solute in the raffinate stream. We'll also then define the distribution coefficient. So the distribution coefficient then is the ratio of the solute in the extract stream over the solute in the raffinate stream. What, so dA then is usually greater than 1 from that definition. So we, we want to select our solvents so that it partitions itself preferentially in the extract stream and less so in the rapid stream. And then we can also uh, show from the thermodynamic calculation using uh, the uh, chemical potential definition there that the that partitioning coefficient or the distribution coefficient uh, is, is really proportional to the chemical potential difference over R time over RT. Really that's essentially saying that if these species, the the, the feed solvent and the, and the uh, extracting solvent, if they have very different chemical potential, we'll get a greater separation. And that, that makes intuitive sense. If we're using oil and water, we expect them to have very different uh, chemical potentials. They separate very well. Uh, two species, uh, conversely, that, that mix quite well with a similar chemical potential and that email made is small. Those are not appropriate choices for solvents. But then species that are very different from each other would have greater uh, ability to partition. And then also, what's interesting, the main reason why I put this equation up here is to show the temperatures in the denominator, indicating that these separations work well at lower temperatures. So at higher temperatures, in fact, we would get poorer separation. And poorer partitioning of the, of the solute in the two, two phases. So that's the, that's the main reason for that equation. Uh, so this is a slide that's not uh, in the notes, I just added this just to give, give a bit of extra background here. Um, liquid liquid extraction is, is, is used in a, in a number of industries. One main area is bioseparations. Um, so for example, penicillin recovery would use liquid liquid extraction. The nuclear industry uses it to recover uranium. Mine industry, one common use is to separate cable from cobalt mines. Uh, that's uh, a difficult separation to achieve, and, and so liquid liquid extraction is, is a newish technology that's, that's used over there. Um, it's widely used in the perfume and fragrance industries and to, to extract essential oils. So this is your typical laboratory experiment where you would say take orange peels or some sort of natural fragrance and you would extract it preferentially into one phase, and then you now need to separate that, that fragrance that, that very complex organic molecule from that solvent and then you could use a liquid-liquid extraction step to achieve that. So these, these, these molecules uh, that are synthesized in perfumes and fragrances, they do a good approximation but they're, they're uh, not always perfect. So we sometimes use natural products like I mentioned, orange peels or other, other uh, natural products and then we need to separate those using liquid-liquid extraction. And then it's widely used in, in a very small uh, scale in, in fine and specialty chemicals. We don't have large volumes. Now the key reason why liquid liquid extraction is used is when we give the temperature sensitive product. So coming back up here, we see their bioseparations and perfumes and fragrances. We cannot separate those out always by distillation. We, we want to use a, a way to separate them that's not going to require excessive heat. And so liquid liquid extraction is a great way to achieve that. High purity requirements, um, so again coming to things like perfumes and bio separations, where we've got very small amount of impurities, if we can then separate that impurity out into one of the other, into the into the um, into one of the liquid phases and then keep the the material interests, so the biomolecule or the fragrance molecule in the other phase, that's a great way to achieve the separation. We, we get a high purity of that fragrance. We, we don't want to contaminate it with um, other, other molecules that could then come through. Or in bioseparation areas, that would be, that it's quite obvious that we don't want to contaminate our species of interest. So we, we, are, we use this liquid-liquid extraction then to preferentially separate the material of interest and then the impurities go into the other stream. 
high boiling point species in low quantities here. By, by that I mean is if, we, if we're interested in a high boiling point species, but it's only present in low quantity, if we did something like distillation, for example, uh, we'd really have to heat a, a whole lot of material up and then put a whole lot of energy into that system to recover that material that has a high boiling point. So that's, that's inefficient. And so we want to then work with systems ideally that we don't require this energy separation, energy separating agent being added. So if we can get away with that, with the simpler system, that, that would be good. The other thing to recognize about distillation is distillation separates by relative volatility. So we're exploiting relative volatility differences, and that means uh, molecules of similar relative volatility will go together in a distillate, and uh, others would then appear in the bottom of the column. But in liquid-liquid extraction, we're going to separate by the species type itself, so the species affinity for either one of the liquid phases over the other is going to uh, drive the separation, rather than relative volatility. If we're also interested in separating, uh, say, our, our feed to a column, uh, sorry, our feed is uh, close in boiling point with the material of interest. So if we look back here, what, uh, what I mean by that is if uh, my feed coming in, which contains the feed solvent as well as the solute, if those two, the solute and the feed, have a very close boiling point, then it's going to be hard to separate it by distillation. So they don't have a high degree of relative volatility. We're going to have to, have to do a, a, have a very large distillation column to separate those two. But if those two species happen to have a high solubility difference, then I can avoid distillation altogether with its, all its energy requirements and simply exploit that solubility difference instead. So whenever we're looking at, at designing a separation process, we should look at the physical properties of the materials we're separating from each other and then find physical properties that are largely different and try to exploit those. So in this case, close boiling points would imply that distillation is not an appropriate separation to use. But if those same two species had high solubility difference, that would tell me use, um, use liquid liquid extraction instead. And then sometimes uh, we, we get azeotropes forming in distillation columns, and you should have seen that in your prior mass separation, uh, mass transfer course. So when we have azeotropes present, we can't, we can't move past them um, from that relative volatility constraint that forms by the operating curves. And so the only way we can get, get through that is, is, is some other method, method that's not relying on relative volatility. And, and so again, if we can exploit the solubility difference, then uh, we can we can break that azeotrope and, and recover those two species. So liquid liquid extraction, and you should see it as a complementary separation step to distillation. That's the key point of this slide, is that many times the disadvantages of the distillation process, high temperature requirements, um, high relative volatility requirements, those may be um, impossible for us, for the species we're dealing with, or energy intensive and costly, especially if we're having to do this in large volume. So if we can uh, then exploit rather solubility differences instead, then liquid-liquid extraction would work well for us. Okay, so then what I thought to start off with in, in today's class, rather than jump into uh, phase diagrams and all sorts of uh, modeling of, of the system, which we'll get to, but I thought rather just to talk a bit about the, what these units look like. Then once you have the units in mind visually, then we can uh, understand it a bit more clearly when we're looking at the mathematic model. So the key thing here is we take our feed and our extracting solvent and we contact them in some way. To, to allow that mass transfer to take place. Key requirements are we want turbulent contact or high, high mass transfer, essentially. And so an effective way to do that is to create small droplets and disperse them in, into each other. So we take our feed and we disperse it as small droplets into our extracting solvent. Or we take our extracting solvent and disperse it as small droplets into the feed. Which way do we pick? Which is the phase you or which is the stream you pick to disperse into the other phase? From an energy requirements point of view, it, it you 
usually makes sense to pick the phase that is present in the smallest amount to break up into droplets. So whichever of those two streams is present in a smaller amount of quantity, disperse that as spinal droplets and treat the other phase then as your, we've called the continuous phase. So this is terminology, always in purple, new terminology is in purple. So our continuous phase is defined as the phase that's not dispersed um, and is continuous then essentially. So we're creating, uh, we're, we want to encourage mass transfer between those two phases, and small droplets is a very effective way of getting a high surface area per unit volume. So the smaller the droplet, the higher the surface area per unit volume. We're also limited though to how much that solvent can pick up the solute. So our constraint always is if that solvent that we've chosen it has a certain limit of solute that it can take up. So that's our key constraint. If we, if we reach that limit, we have to simply add more solvent to the system to, to extract the amount of solute. So we, we know usually the amount of we, we always know the solute amount coming in. And so we then calculate the theoretical maximum of solute that we can load into that solvent. And that gives us a bound and a on our solvent requirements. Um, if, we're, if we're going to exceed that bound, we simply have to add more solvent to the system. So then that, that's, this always here, that's our dollar figure coming in. That extracting solvent is, is, the, is the mass separating agent that we're adding. So we really want to maximize the amount of solute we can load up into that solvent and then take out here in the extract stream. We really want a high concentration of our, of our solute in that extract stream and we want a low concentration in the raffinate. Sometimes you see in, in some older outdated literature they will call that the pregnant liquid. It's the, the, the stream that's loaded up with the solute. And they will call this the mother liquid. <laughs> okay, so, um, so, so just uh, we really want a high recovery then of, our, of our solute in that extract. So that's the mixing phase, the, the, then we require separation. So that's the reverse of the, of the previous step. Okay, so this is exactly where one of the, this is where the art comes in designing these systems, is when you realize you have to have good mixing up here, but you don't want to mix it so thoroughly that you can never separate them again. You want to be able to reverse that previous mixing step, allow the droplets to coalesce, and then you rely on the density differences for those two phases to separate. And then you, you collect those two phases and, and pull them out into, into the separate streams here. So uh, just uh, let's take a look here then at the next slide. Uh, please just delete those two stupid sentences that you didn't much at the time. Um, the key things we're aiming for here are we want a very high recovery of solute in the, in the, in the desirable phase, in, the, in other words, the extract phase. So a high recovery of solute is what we're aiming for. And we don't just want a high recovery of it. So recovery purely refers to the mass balance. It's how much of the material comes in, and then how much of that's recovered in the extract phase. We want that to be as high as possible, but we also want that concentration to be really high in the extract phase. high recovery and high concentrations. If we don't get high concentrations, then we're going to have to still have a separate step downstream to then get that solute out of that, out of that uh, phase. So we want both good recovery and, and, and high concentrations. And the most effective way then to do that is to use counter current type equipment. So I presume you've learned about co-current and counter current systems from your mass transfer course. So this terminology is not something we're going to review here, but countercurrent systems then are, are clearly the more effective way to achieve this. We want high interfacial area during the mixing, so that comes down to mass transfer limitations. We want to minimize that mass transfer resistance as much as possible. We'll see how, that, how we can do that. And then we really want to promote mass transfer as well by using any diffusion. So molecular diffusion was what I said earlier. So if I just put the two in contact with each other and rely on the molecules and natural movements at that interface to cause diffusion. But any diffusion is I'm adding mechanical energy and creating this contact. 
So let's take a look at uh, what some of these units look like in a, in a minute. Uh, and I'll just break up this slide we've had previously. It's uh, more crude. I've just added a bit more detail here. Um, and this is, a, this is posted on the course website, so if you just want to update your notes from there, that's, that's great. Or we'll copy it down now and pass it to the slide. Um, either way, the main point, the main ways in which we tend to mix to create good contact between our feed and our solvent is the most obvious is to use an impeller. So simply add this material into a mixer and really agitate it with a good, with a good uh, impeller. And so there's a number of interesting impeller designs to create that good contact between two liquid phases. Uh, one of which is the Russian turbine that you've probably seen in your labs. So that, that, that uh, impeller shape is designed for good liquid-liquid contact between two phases. Uh, you can also use nozzles, uh, so you can pinch these two fluids right in the, in the nozzle and, and cause mixing in line in the pipe uh, with, a, with a good feed nozzle. Um, and especially with the add twirls on that nozzle to create a good mixing of the, of the two phases. And it's interesting, you can actually you can create this whole separation in line in a pipe. So sometimes they'll just have a long pipe. In the center of the pipe, there will be a nozzle type device that causes mixing between the two phases. And then you just rely on laminar flow throughout the rest of the pipe for those two phases to separate out. So you don't even need a special unit for this. It can be done in line in a pipe. Um, other ways in which you can contact your two, two streams is directly in the pump. So you simply use a centrifugal pump and at the, at the impellers in the pump, you can bring the two feed streams right in and they get intimately mixed and contacted right, right over there. Then there's some interesting gear type devices. So what I mean by that is you have uh, two, uh, you have these two gears moving inside one inside each other and you force the material from the center through the gears, so as these rotate, it, it causes contact uh, between the two phases and as they move through those teeth of the gears. So this is why we're using the pharmaceutical industry to create emulsions and good mixing between two, two streams. This also because it's easy to sanitize with high pressure steam afterwards. So that's the main reason why we use that. So the key issue is we want good contact. You want to, though, avoid this case of small droplets usually smaller than two microns. Okay, where does that constraint come from? Why do you want to avoid these very small droplets? <coughs> we covered this already in the earlier part of the course. Yeah, avoid a colloidal or an emulsion type uh, system from occurring that will then never separate out. The key point here is that our su subsequent settling step is by gravity. It's essentially a sedimentation. You're sedimenting a, a liquid of heavier density in a lighter density. So you've got small droplets of a heavy density that has to move down through liquid of a lighter density. So you get your lighter droplets moving up and your smaller droplets moving down. It's essentially just the same equation from sedimentation. And when we looked at sedimentation, the particle size is, from Stokes' law, the terminal settling velocity. You can look at it from the terminal settling velocity of a heavy particle down. You can also simply see it as the, the rising velocity of the lighter particle upwards through a heavier stream. Stokes' law would apply when you flip your coordinate system 180 degrees just as well. So either way, we want to avoid very small particle size because recall from Stokes' law, dp appears in there to the power squared. So dp squared, the smaller you make that, the much, much smaller your settling velocity. That means you need really, really large units to then settle out your um, contacted phases. So we want good mass transfer, which tells us to use smaller and smaller particles. But we also want to then have a good separation in the next step where we settle out. So we don't want two small particles either. So we've, we've always got that, uh, that, that, that constraint over there. 
There's a number of interesting ways that you can encourage the setting to occur and, and create coalescence. One of which is to, uh, most simply, is to use baffles. Uh, some people have used membrane-type designs as well to, to cause coalescence. Um, or packing inside like a like column, we'll see some of that. You can use ultrasound then as well to, to, to achieve that. Um, chemical treatment. So by modifying the pH or adding another chemical species in there, you can encourage droplets to coalesce faster than they would otherwise. Um, and in fact, you can then also combine the theory we learned about centrifuges. So all the stuff we learned earlier on centrifuges was simply to accelerate sedimentation. So given that we want to settle out a lighter phase and a heavier phase, rather than just allowing gravity to do that, we can simply use a centrifuge to, to do it. So two liquids in a centrifuge uh, can work just as well. So there's also one reason why I've covered the material in the order that I've covered it. Is, uh, we looked at sedimentation first, then centrifuges, and, and then now this. Which is what I find so unusual all the other textbooks that look at sedimentation and centrifuges right at the end. So it's always, uh, I never understood that. So, that, uh, so there's a reason why we looked at centrifuges earlier. So we can now use all of that same theory of two phase liquids instead of the solid in the liquid, which is what we considered in centrifuges earlier. We can simply just replace the density from the centrifuge equations with the liquid density of the heavier phase and then the liquid density of the lighter phase. Okay, and then we'll see there that we can then uh, typically also do this in a, in a column type of situation. So we use the column both for contacting and for separating. Um, and we can have the column with nothing in there, just essentially two liquids, we can count the current. We can have trays, we can have packing in the columns, we can have some sort of form of pulsation in the columns to create good mixing. That's used in the nuclear industry for the uranium recovery. Um, and then we can even have columns with agitation in them. So we add added colors at every tray in the column. And then uh, we'll look at some interesting rotating devices. So, so this is kind of set, set the scene, and we'll look at some of these units tomorrow, some of these fixed assemblers, some of these columns, and some of the criteria related to them. And then we'll move into, um, shortly after that, a lot of these things that you may have from chemistry. So, so we'll have a quick recap of what those phase diagrams are all about.